Good morning. Good morning. Happy Mother's Day. It's March. I mean, it's May. <laughs> May 10th. Who knew? Anyway, thanks for joining us. We're just been having some technical difficulties today, but we're good now. So I wanted to start out today. We're going to do communion in a few minutes. So if you need some juice and some mealy cracker, then be sure and go and get those while I'm talking. But I wanted to just give the mothers an encouragement today. I woke up this morning and I thought, you know, God's not really a human. So he's not male or female. He's spirit. And but then I got to thinking, but he made mankind in his image. So he must have a component within his image and his nature that he made in humanity. So the coolest thing that we can't understand about God that's kind of mind blowing is that like he gets it how mothers feel. He gets it how fathers feel because he's both. And so what he did because you know it would just blow up humanity I'm sure. But he made man and he made woe man to be on the earth and to create and then they create children but guess what he is the first father the first mother everybody came from his womb in fact it says in Psalms 103 that he is abounding in compassion and the footnote on that word compassion is that it comes from the the womb of God the compassion is how he feels about his children, how he mothers his children. And so I was thinking about this verse, and, and uh, it's in Isaiah 49. And it's kind of, I want to call this the mother's promise today. You know, God's, every one of God's promises carries with it the signature of hope. It means that wait... That's, that's hoping, wait, because my promise is going to come true. Yeah. And see, since God works outside of time, and we work inside of time, so we're watching the timeline, we're watching the days and the calendar, and we're, we're either filled with hope and anticipation for what's about to come around the corner that's so good, or we're counting the days from the last time it went bad. And I just think God wants to give us an encouragement today. So let me read this to you. It says, is it possible for a mother? Now think about this from God's perspective. Act like God's the mother. Is it possible for a mother, however disappointed, however hurt, to forget her nursing child? Can she feel nothing for the baby she carried in birth? He's asking questions of us. He's basically answering the question with the question. He said, even if she could, I, God, will never forget you. So he's, he's trying to say that Jesus came, it says, and he's acquainted or shared or took our grief. And then I'm going to preach on this today, that now because of what Jesus did, he took our grief our suffering, we're never going to have to go to the cross to die for sin. So now we get to co-labor with God. And so he's saying that now you get to experience what I feel as God the mother, God the father. God's not male. God is spirit. And so within the Godhead, this is, I just feel like he's really speaking this over. All three parts of God are saying this today. Look here. I've made you a part of me written you on the palms of my hand I, I read a footnote about that that said sometimes they put inscriptions somewhere on their body you know kind of like we do tattoos to kind of signify how we're feeling about life and God people would have have things on them to say they belong to somebody but he said they couldn't see it they couldn't see it 
And so he had to write it on the palm of their hand because how often do you, how, how easy is that right there? You can see that anytime. And he said, your city walls are always on my mind. What are city walls? It's the component of what makes us. So everything that has to do with you today, everything you're thinking about, everything that concerns you, all your city walls, they're always on his mind and they're always his concern. He said, now... Sweet Zion, your children are running back to you just as fast as those who destroyed you are leaving. Raise your head, lift up your eyes, and watch your heart's desire come. All your children gathered, returning to you. As I live, so I promise. You will wear them with pride all the shining like all the shining ornaments of a bride you will put them on as a bride on her wedding day so you know one of the things in life is that that sometimes we want something for someone more than they even want it for themselves sometimes it seems but this is God's promise to mothers today so if you're a mom today and your children are not serving God, and you are serving God, then you have a promise that he, this is what he said, all your children gathered and returning to you, as I live, so I promise. See, God doesn't say something that he doesn't plan on working to fulfill it. He didn't even say, all your children will gather to you if you go and do a bunch of stuff. He just said, as he lives, this is his promise. And so I just wanted to pray before we take communion today, this promise over the mothers. I just feel like it's a great promise. I just want to honor my mom today. I know that she's watching and I just want to tell her that, that she always taught me God's ways. And so this promise about all her children returning, she doesn't have to pray that over my life because I've always served him. But Maybe you can take this promise if you're a mom out there and your child doesn't know God, isn't following his ways, and you're hungering for that. Can you just do this process where it's the great exchange, where you take this desire and this need that he knows so well, he's so acquainted with your desire for your children to know him. And can you take that and lay that at his feet and, and ask him specifically, I'm taking my children and I'm laying them at your feet because you can't save them anyway. They've always been God's children. And say, what do you have for me? I believe that God doesn't want us to get stuck on who doesn't know him, but he wants us to run, run, run with him. And so he doesn't want us to get stuck on what isn't yet because he doesn't work inside of time. He wants us to run with him. And just like the prodigal's father, he just kept the farm going. And when the prodigal had come to the end of his ways, then the father was waiting there with a ring and a robe. And that's our good, good father. He's a father and mother. He's all those things. And he's caring for your children today, just like he cared for you. Even if you were away from God, one day you came back to God. We're all his children. We're all going to come back to him in some way. And so I just want to play, pray over the moms today. So Papa, I just send out a blessing to the moms today. I ask that this promise would be part of their DNA, that it would be part of their mindset, that you said you would gather them back. And Papa, I know that mothers are not just to be mothers to just their own physical children, but they are actually spiritual mothers. And, and I know that your desire is for them to mother more than just their own children, that they are to take on spiritual children because there's an epidemic, a pandemic of fatherless and motherless children. So there's plenty of children who need a mother's love to go around. So I just pray, pray that even if these moms that are listening to me their children aren't within their relationship like they want that you would bring spiritual children for them to lavish your love onto them and I ask today that would be the great exchange that I give you my child and I take on your children your humanity and I breathe and I love them just like a father and a mother would be meant to love and if you've experienced the love of God you have something to give away so I just speak into that heart of that mother and I say mother children 
It doesn't matter if they're your natural children. Don't get focused on what your natural children are doing, but mother the children of God because we're all part of this one family. And so I bless you, mothers, today. I bless you. I just thank you today for mothers. I thank you for godly mothers, especially. I thank you for godly mothers. I know it is a price to be paid to be a godly mom. And I thank you for the moms that have trained their children in the ways that they should go because your promise is that that they will not depart from it. They will not depart from the deposits of truth that you put into their lives. So I bless you in Jesus' name. I just want you to welcome Pam. She's going to come and share communion with us. And then we'll worship a little bit. I love communion. Because it's for every person who was far away. Can come close. I remember when I was far away. When I was the children they were just praying for. And he found me on a road somewhere. He healed my heart. He set me free. And he set me on fire with a love that he gave me. And so today, that's my short testimony, that now I stand living in sweet communion all my days. So the beauty of communion is for those who've received Jesus And they want to come close in that intimate, sweet union. You know, communion is very relational. It's not abstract or an informational idea or a concept. It's relational. And it's real. And it's tangible. And it's deep. And it's spiritual. It's a spiritual union. And that's why communion is for believers. Because it is so intimate. It is so relational. It is two parties coming together. And with honor and reverence and respect and love and affection and adoration. Sharing and exchange. You know, I I love how personal it is. You know, it's personal. Communion's personal. Maybe you could think just a second how personal communion is for Jesus. You know, I just can't keep from singing and saying this this song of old that's been on my heart. Love came down and rescued me. And I really needed it. And it's that love that came down and it set me free. And so now I live in that sweet place of intimacy.
just that spiritual oneness. Me with him and him with me. And so for Jesus, it's personal. Because it said that Jesus was slain before the foundation of the world was laid. Where he had a lot of forethought. That I'm going to create something out of me, which is humanity. And I'm going to pre-plan to take care and to cover and to provide and to nurture and to make safe and to keep into union with me. So when it was time for creation, and I think about, wow, God can create anything he wants and he has. And I think about when I'm at that beginning place in his heart and in his mind, when he has a longing. And from that place, he creates you and me. He's an intimate creator. And he has a strong passion to be in union with his creation. So today, if you are on the road, sometimes we find ourselves and you're missing out on that sweet union. You don't know how to find your way back. It's real simple. He's standing right there. So all you have to do is say, Jesus, I really need you. My life is missing something. And it's that life union, it's that spirit union, it's that connection. You know, it is the highest, most intimate relationship that you can have, spirit to spirit, creator to creation. It's a deep love. And so he wants you to know that today. So if that's you, then you just have to say, Jesus, I really need you. Today I'm willing to let it all go. I'm willing to forgive and ask to be forgiven. I'm asking you to come and remove all the harm, all the injury, all the pain. I need your life to come into me and make me new. May your spirit spring up as a wellspring of life in me today and reconnect me relationally, intimately to my God, my Savior, and my King. Reorder my life. Rewrite my history. Clear all of the debris. Help me discover and see what you see. So as you do that process, that means that he comes in and he says, yes, I forgive. I forgive. 
I release. I come in. I begin to set an order and to strengthen, to make safe and to open up and to heal and to give you a vision for your life. So if that's you, that's what we call being born again. Saying, Jesus, thank you that you paid the price for me. It's very personal for him. You know, yesterday morning when I was praying, I was thinking about communion. It was this interesting thing that was happening. I could physically feel the wounds in his hands. So I just kept feeling that. And I was thinking about what that day looked like. What did that look like that day when he gave it all and held nothing back and said, this is my purpose for which I came, is to come and to break off harm and sin and the enemy's dominion over your life and to break you free. I know there was a, it was a huge sacrifice. So as I sat there and I thought about that, I just kept feeling the palm of my hand. And I remembered when, after he gave his life and paid for rebellion and sin so we could return and we could be renewed and brought back to the Father, I remembered that he appeared after he rose again. And for the simple fact that God's power raised him from the dead after he laid his life down, that communicates that that was a worthy sacrifice. That was the only sacrifice that could forgive sin. And with one broad breaststroke of his life, Jesus walked this earth and he laid his life down And he surrendered so that we could be forgiven. And he let them pierce his hands and his feet. And he said, no one takes my life from me. I choose to give it. I choose to lay it down because it is the only thing that will restore you back to intimacy with me and with the Father and with the Spirit. The Father, the Spirit, and the Son. So then I thought about Jesus giving his life and God saying, that is acceptable to me. That is the spotless lamb, the innocent one who was giving, who poured out his life's blood, who laid it down. And I accept that sacrifice. I accept that sacrifice over you. And as we take that sacrifice on, then that is acceptable to God. And as he was resurrected and he showed himself, I love how he said, I want to show myself to the disciples. And he went and he spent time with them after he was resurrected. The power of God raised Jesus from the dead because that was an acceptable sacrifice. There's only one worthy. There's only one worthy. And as he was raised, he began to proof and show himself and to appear and to sit and to spend time. And it says he began to discuss with his disciples whom he was leaving his ministry with. He he taught them all the things of the kingdom, all the insights. And he said, Thomas, touch my hands. You once doubted, but come and feel it's tangible and it's real and it's alive. And it's me. And that is that resurrection power that believers live in, are inundated with, is that sweet union that gets restored. God's spirit to our spirit. 
once we are forgiven because of that sacrifice. And our lives are raised up to be new and different and whole and powerful and reflective of the good father. And I love what Jesus said. That I set a table before you to come and to commune with me when you're a believer. It's this table that is ever set before us and the table is Jesus. I am the one. I set the table and I set the table with me. I set it with everything that flows out of me from me to you. Healing and mercy and dreams and visitations and encounters and provision and promises. He is so rich and so full. And from that place of that acceptable sacrifice that he presents himself, he is the table. He says, come, come, dine and eat. So every time we take communion, we are saying that is an acceptable sacrifice. That is provision for my life that sustains me and strengthens me and encourages me. It blesses me and it feeds me and it's, it's what I live from. It's my vital necessity. So when Jesus says, this is my blood in communion and this is my body, if you will eat it and drink of it, that will be a new covenant between you and me. It's, it's stronger than a marriage covenant because it's a spiritual marriage covenant between God himself and you. And from that place, there's a great exchange there. All of me presenting myself to all of you. So it says, as often as you take of this, remember me. So that's an invitation for believers today to remember that I am the perfect sacrifice that is acceptable. And because of that, there's so much that you can receive from me today that I want to give to you. I want to wash away any harm, any sickness, any disease. I want to heal anything relationally, poverty-wise that you have going on. The fullness of me wants to encounter all the places of you. So come. Can you hear him say, come, dine, eat. So every time it says that you partake of communion, you are proclaiming to the universe. You're making a declaration that I am partaking of the Son of God, the innocent Lamb who was slain and is now risen again and causes me to be raised up with Him forevermore. And from that place, I draw from Him my life and my substance. And so today, whatever that you have need of, that you want to bring into your table, He says, here I am. Here I am. And I want to give that to you. And as you partake of that, you are proclaiming unto the universe that there is one king and there is one savior. And he is intimately acquainted with me and I with him and we are one. And I draw from the sun from all that he has set the table for me. Whether it's healing, forgiveness, restoration, a sound mind, whatever that is that you have need of today. So let's position our hearts. Let's just say, Papa God, I don't want to bring anything to the communion table today that is not from a right heart. Why would I want to come and try to receive so much that you have freely given but hold a grudge. 
We all need forgiveness. And when we forgive and we release, then he comes in with a refreshing and a renewal and a strengthening. So just, we're going to take just a second. I want you to just take a minute and just ask him, search your heart. Say, Holy Spirit, is there anything in me today that needs to be cleared away? Whether it's harm or injury or hurt or pain or confusion or misunderstanding or offense. I don't want to hold that in my heart. So it's hypocrisy to say that I am who I am and I need what I need. And I want you to do that for me, but I won't extend that to others. So so there's a way that I get to come into both of those places as you let go and you forgive. I will enter in and cover and wash both places. It's not a feeling. It's a choice. He chose to die. You can choose to forgive. So Jesus, because we trust you and your way is right and good and true, we obey And we say, I hold nothing in my heart against any man. I'm willing to let it go into your care for you to work it out, for you to manage, for you to oversee, for you to be in charge of. I let it go. And I forgive. And as I forgive, I ask to be forgiven for all the ways that I think and act that are against your heart. And I ask you to come with your refreshing renewal. Refreshing always comes with repentance. So I just speak for the Holy Spirit to come rushing into those places and to wash over, to remove the sting, to restore trust that you are working all things out for our good because we love you and we are called according to your purpose and we trust you in all the affairs of our lives and our relationships. And so we say, have your perfect work. So from that pure, clean heart, Jesus, we come before you. We take the bread. We say, thank you that you gave your body that it was beaten 
And by your stripes, we are healed and we physically experience healing and restoration and strength from you today. Body, soul, and spirit, we invite you to come as we come to your table. Thank you for your sacrifice today, Jesus. So I eat what you provide for me today. So I speak for healing to flow right now in Jesus' name. From the provision of your perfect sacrifice, Lamb of God. I speak healing right now. Healing, healing, miracles, relational restorations. Divine providence over your people. Right mindedness. So Jesus, today we take the cup of the blood of your covenant, of your life poured out for mine, and I say we freely and gladly drink. Thank you that you cleanse us from all unrighteousness for your name's sake, and you restore us, and you raise us up. So we thank you that we encounter and we relate to you from this raised up place today of being in right relationship and right standing with you today. So I speak strength into those spiritual unions through this communion right now in Jesus' name. I speak strength, 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 new intimacy, new places of intimacy, a freshness of your spirit right now in Jesus' name. Amen. celebrating what Jesus has done for us. And he said, I need you to come close today. I need you to come so close to me. I was telling the worship team this morning that he gave me this new spin on the story of the woman with the issue of blood that from a religious standpoint, we can sometimes tend to view her as this negative person that maybe had sin in her life or had something wrong with her that she was in great need of healing for but he just gave me this really sweet other perspective this morning of really what his heart was in that moment with her and what it continues to be for us for eternity is that in that moment when she was reaching out to touch him she was reaching out to touch him spirit to spirit because she was perceiving that there was a a kindred spirit that they had that there was a connection of who he was, that she was reaching out to know that this is who she was, that she's pure and that she's whole and that she's worthy of his love. And that he was saying that then in that moment when his power left him, I believe it's because there was a, a kindred spirit connection in that moment where their two hearts were one. And he was saying, yes, that your faith has healed you. Your faith that you are whole, that you are pure, and that you're just like me has healed you. That it was an identity shift that happened to her in that moment. And so I just want to speak that over us today as we just step into worship, that we're worshiping the Lamb of God for this identity restoration that He's bringing us today just through this communion time and that He's saying, you're so worthy of my touch. You're so worthy to be entwined as one with me. We are kindred spirits. We are spirit to spirit connection. You are made in my image and so you are worthy of everything that I have. You're worthy of all of me. 
And that's what she was tapping into in that moment. And so I just want to invite all of us to enter into this really sweet time of worship, tapping into who he is and who we are.
told us who we've always been all along. You told us who we've always been all along. Oh, Jesus, you stepped in. You stepped in with your love songs. You told us who we've always been. I just really feel like that we need to just really offer up this Thanksgiving that Shudi is singing right now. I just keep hearing those lines, you pick me up and you turn me around, you set my feet on solid ground, and I just want to thank you. And I just want us to sing that together, but first I want you to, I want you to remember back where you were when he picked you up and he turned you around. You know, it's, it's probably not even the really the first time you ever got saved. Maybe it was. But a lot of people I know, they, they knew God. But then they knew Him. Yeah. I'm talking about that day that, yes. that you knew Him. You know, I, Pam was up here. Leading us in a beautiful ministry of his communion communion over our hearts but I remember a Mother's Day when I took Pam to church real church you know she was raised Catholic and Joyce Meyer was ministering on the heart of the father that's the day Pam came to really know him so Maybe this Mother's Day, you can experience a newness of Him. And He picked you up. And He turned you around. He set you on a completely different direction. That's why we sing hallelujah. That's why we say we just want to thank you. Because of the day that He picked us up. And He turned us around. So let's just sing this with the team. Turn me around, you place my feet on solid. 
feet on solid ground Now you picked me up, turned me around Placed my feet on solid ground One more time, let's just sing it one more time. You picked me up, turned me around, and placed my feet on solid ground. Hallelujah! Hallelujah! You know, you picked me up, and turned me around, and placed my feet on solid ground. Hallelujah! Jesus, I just want to tell you today. You deserve all my hallelujahs, all my tens and tens and tens and thousands of praises go to you, Jesus. You deserve them all, Jesus. The price you pay, Jesus, you deserve all my praises. You deserve all my hallelujahs today. I just want to tell you thank you, Jesus. I want to tell you thank you, Jesus, that I know you today. I know it was all because of you pulling me toward you pulling me to your side you chased after me you chased after me to know you and so I just thank you Jesus I just thank you Jesus I just thank you Jesus I thank you Jesus I thank you for the opportunity to know you to love you I hadn't planned on reading this little scripture, but I keep feeling like I should, so. It's Isaiah 53, who has truly believed our revelation to whom will Yahweh reveal his mighty arm? For he sprouted up like a tender plant before the Lord, like a root in a parched land. He possessed no distinguishing beauty or outward splendor to catch our attention. Nothing special in his appearance to make us desire him. He was despised and rejected by men, a man acquainted with deep sorrows, who was no stranger to suffering or grief. We hid our faces from him in disgust and considered him a nobody, not worthy of respect yet. He was the one who carried our sicknesses, yet he was the one who endured the torment of our sufferings. We viewed him as the one who was being punished for something that he himself had done, as the one who was struck down by God and brought low, but it was because of us. But it was because of our rebellious deeds that he was pierced. And because of our sins that he was crushed. He endured that punishment, the punishment that makes me completely whole. And in his wounding, we find our healing. Oh, like wayward sheep, we have wandered astray. Each of us has turned from God's path and has chosen our, chosen our own way. But even so, Yahweh laid the guilt of our every sin upon him. He was so oppressed and harshly mistreated, so he humbly submitted, refusing to even defend himself. He was brought like a gentle lamb to be slaughtered, like a silent sheep before his shearers, but he did not even open his mouth. By coercion, And with the perversion of justice, he was taken away. And who could have even imagined his future? He was cut down in the prime of his life for the rebellion of his own people. He was struck down in their place. They gave him a grave among criminals, but he ended up instead in a rich man's tomb. And although he had done no violence or spoken deceitfully, even though... All of that it pleased Yahweh to crush him with grief because he knew he would restore him with favor. 
And after his soul becomes a guilt offering for you, he will gaze upon his many offspring. That's you. He will gaze upon his many offspring. And though through him you always deepest desire will be fully accomplished after the great anguish of his soul, he will see the light. And the greatest astonishing statement in the Bible is that he will be fully satisfied. By knowing him, the righteous one, my servant will make many come to be righteous because he, their sin bearer, carried away their sin. So I, Yahweh, will assign him a portion among a great multitude and he will triumph and divide the spoils of victory with his mighty ones. That's you. And all because he poured out his lifeblood to death and he was counted among the worst sinners, yet he carried sin's burdens for many. And now he intercedes for those who are rebels. It's the greatest passage in the Bible of what just happened. Today you came to know the king in a new way and he did all of that for you. There's nothing left for him to do. That's why we say thank you. There's no more sin offering needed. There's no more attempts by humanity to satisfy anything. But Yahweh made a plan. And even if you can't understand that plan, even if something has happened that makes that plan get all messed up in your head, it's still His plan. The greatest lesson of your life to know is that Yahweh made a plan for you. He made a plan that you can be saved. And that's why we say thank you. So one more time, I just say thank you, Jesus. I just say thank you, Jesus. My words, I know, are so inadequate, so I choose to lay my life down for you, this King. I choose to give my life in service to you. I choose to be what you call me to be. I choose to train and equip your people to carry out the works on this earth they were meant to carry out. And so I just say thank you. I just say thank you. I just say thank you. One more time, bro. Sing it one more time. Well, you picked me up and turned me around. Place my feet on solid ground. Hallelujah. That's what he did for every one of you today. Hallelujah. And when you picked me up, turned me around. Placed my feet on solid ground. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And we say thank you. Thank you, Jesus. We say thank you. Thank you, Jesus. We say thank you. We say thank you. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We just give you all the honor. All the praise goes to you. You're so worthy today. You're so worthy today. And we just thank you. We just thank you. We just thank you. We just thank you. I know having a worshiper's heart, I could go on forever. But I feel like today I just wanted to bring this faith-filled word of encouragement. I still don't know what I'm preaching on exactly, so. But I started a message, we started a message last week about ministering to the Lord, and I think I kind of want to call it part two. But I've been, we, our tribe has been doing some prayer walks, and so I found myself out with the nature dweller, Mendel. She catches a glimpse of nature in a way that I've never, I've never experienced. And so it opens my eyes to 
a lot of what is interesting and so about God because he's in all of creation, right? Yeah, yeah. So we were out at the having this little walk and talking and praying and just talking about just the good things of God and I pulled up to the lake and there was a a girl there that I that I've seen there. She looks like she's a young little twelve year old girl or so, and she's usually swinging in her hammock drawing. But this day, there are th- three sets of ducklings that have been born over the last two weeks at this little pond where we walk, and there are there's one set of sixteen, one set of twenty, and one set of about thirteen, and they're all different sizes, and I mean, like, you can tell that a few of them are just a couple of days old. Well, our little hammock dweller had decided that she would get a big stick, and I think that particular day she must have been frustrated about something else, I guess, and so she was, I saw her hitting the stick, and then she threw the stick, and it was a pretty big stick, out into the lake, into the group of small, tiny, two-day-old ducklings, so, you know, I'm not a natural mother, but I'm going to talk to you about my kind of mothering today. Yeah. My kind of mothering is actually found in, in Numbers 25, but I'm not sure if I'm going to read that to you today. It's the Old Testament version of God's goodness. Um, but I was able to conduct the stop throwing the stick process <laughs> with small little hammock dweller. But I was, as we began to walk around the lake that day, it became apparent to me that there was an agitation in, in that atmosphere. It was very odd. You know, there's the one thing I think in my lifetime that I hope I what I call get around the corner on is, is understanding the nature in which God made all of our gifts to operate with creation. You know, we try to come up with titles for it, names for it. We try to identify it. I don't know if you can feel that urgency to identify and help people to understand why they feel the way they feel and you know, when I was watching that little girl, it reminded me of this scripture that I read a couple of weeks ago in Colossians 20. I mean, 2. There's not a Colossians 20. Colossians 2, 20. And remember it said, don't retreat back to being bullied by the standards yeah. and opinions of re- religion. And I was thinking of a story that Benny Hinn told years ago that he was at this church and he was standing on the platform and he saw the Jezebel spirit standing by and he was looking around for a leader to do something about this spirit that was freely in operation. And, and I know that that brings, um, that brings us into the weirdness of God, maybe if you will, (laughs) that if we don't even know what that means, that sometimes have you noticed when we don't know, what something means about God, we sometimes try to stay away from it. And so I, I was thinking about that little girl, and then subsequently a bunch of th- stuff happened around the lake. We saw these the three mean pack of ducks, and they were trying to be mean. Then we saw Mr. Mad Duck, and he was chasing the mother around across the road. And, you know, it was just, it was like an agitated spirit that was going on. And then at the end, we saw these, geese and they came flying up and they spread their wings out and threw their chest back and they were squawking and squawking and I was just asking the Lord I was like what what are you saying and and um so I, I wrote this little ditty I'm always trying to prove the goodness of God no matter what situation I'm in I search and I look for the goodness of his plan versus the grandeur of the problem I'm facing. I'm always trying to prove God's goodness. No matter if I get something wrong or in my trying I mess something up again, I know 
my seeing is being refined because I'm always trying to prove God's goodness. My definition of him is, is constantly undergoing editing. I press in to learn more about his nature because I'm always trying to prove God's goodness. When it feels like I can't see it, I wait until the fog lifts before announcing my conclusions. Because I'm always trying to prove the goodness of God. My life is in search of single-mindedness. The mind of Christ is in me. It was a gift to me. So I'm always trying to prove God's goodness. So I'm, I'm exchanging my thoughts for His. What a privilege. To know His ways of love. Because I'm always trying to prove God's goodness. When I discovered He was always good, I set my heart to prove His goodness to everyone I can. To find the new perspective of the heart of God. The goodness of Him. Because I'm always trying to prove God's goodness. I thought this week how I'm a trainer of the mind of Christ. Yeah. You know, that is a gift that comes with salvation. You know, salvation's fullness is ever expanding in you as you press in to know Him. The experience of what Jesus did on the cross is ever expanding in you yeah. as you press in yeah. to know Him. Yeah. What we just talked about today and this communion experience yeah. is because yeah. the mind of Christ is trying to expand. The salvation of what all He did on the cross is trying to expand within you. And so with that expansion process, it pushes out yeah. old ways that had become familiar. Yeah. And we are unaccustomed to how to operate with these new digits. <laughs> you know, I've, I speak about this a lot. I'm not a first-generation Christian or... I'm not a first generation having an understanding of the prophetic. So nothing that I'm doing with my life is first generation in God. But I will say I'm the first generation that pursued ardently His presence above all else. That I would remove things out of my life on purpose to just test to see if His presence became more real to me. I love this scripture in 1 Corinthians 2, 5. It says, for God intended. Don't you love to know the intention of God? Yeah. See, whenever you begin to understand that God had an intention with everything, then don't hang on to something that doesn't pay off because it's a waste. Yeah. So in creation, you see like that day when I was watching all this activity at this lake that's usually really peaceful it started out with this agitated little girl I began to ask him you know what's going on with her you know obviously she's com comes out there often alone and so I, I started thinking about the aloneness of her little life I don't know why she was throwing two big sticks at tiny little helpless creatures but it's probably the same reason that a little bit later, a guy with his dog, his big dog, came and scared all the ducks into the water. The tiny little helpless creatures. See, we don't often know how to appropriate what authority that we have. So we often appropriate it wrongly. And then we then say, oh, what happened to humanity? He said, for God intended that your faith not be established on man's wisdom, 
but by trusting in his almighty power. That's dunamis. Remember, I talked about dunamis a few weeks ago. He intended on your faith to be established on the foundation of his power. Do you understand the connection between his power and your faith? See, without faith, it's impossible to please God. And so he gave you the measure of faith needed to please him. It's, it's trusting and establishing on that he wants to do anything through me. And he isn't coming down to earth to do it. You're here. He's not going to be arriving tomorrow with his angelic hosts. Maybe not tomorrow. To reign and tell what? The bride is acting like a bride. The bride is acting like I'm pure. See, he died so that you get... It's okay. He died... So that you get to, we have a fly in here, so it's really bugging everybody. Stay focused. He died so that you get to experience full salvation. Yeah. Yeah. You get to experience the dunamis in you. Yeah. You get to attach your faith yes. to the dunamis, not to your ability. Yes. Yes. See, we are not seeing more healing. We're not seeing more salvation because we're not relying on the dunamis. Yeah. We're relying on the treasonous. Whatever your nest is. I was, I was reading, let's turn, those are just some free scriptures for you. You're welcome. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians 10. I began to read this passage of scripture the other day, this chapter. And it seemed really strange to me, and I I wanted to share my thoughts about it to help you. Verse In the Passion Translation, of course, you know it's my favorite right now. But the title of 1 Corinthians 10 is Learning from Israel's Failures. And so he goes on to talk about, as we all know around here, this story, don't we know it well, of God's desire to bring to save the children of Israel, bring them out of Egypt, to come to the wilderness, to meet with him, be cleansed by him, be empowered by him, and then go into the promised land. He was going to eradicate all of the people in the promised land, not because he was about, what do they call that? Genocide, is that the word? That's probably not the word. We're removing all races of people. That wasn't the goal. He was removing people's hearts that weren't devoted to him. See, God's, Always, the, the goal of God, if you understand with humanity, is to teach them for them to be his people and he to be their God, right? That's his goal. That's why he made man. He made Adam and Eve in the garden to what? To be with them. Right. There was nothing going on at first mention in the garden about any sort of rebellion. They, in fact, they didn't even have to wear clothes. What is going on there? Right? They were so comfortable in their nakedness, in their vulnerability. It was when a choice was made against God's design. God wasn't sitting there waiting with a hammer to whack them over the head. He, w- he did not want to make robots. See, that's the, I tell you all the time, it's the greatest thing God made. He made the power of choice. And he made a law on earth to go with choices. It's called reaping and sowing. The laws of God, like gravity, like reaping and sowing, are for all humanity, whether they act like there's a God or not. There's no one on the earth that can be like, I am not going to do gravity anymore. Absolutely not. I've just decided... Part of my atheistic belief is that God did not create gravity, and so I will just walk out of buildings at any height I want. (laughs) What will happen? Quickly, they will discover there is a God. 
quickly they will discover there is a law of God in operation. And see, God made it really clear. There's laws of God. There's reaping and sowing. But he's also a rewardable God. He, he is rewarding behavior that goes along with who he is in his character for humanity. Yeah. And see, since Jesus came and he satisfied, that's why he became acquainted with what? Our sufferings. Yeah. So let's go on and see if I can get us here. So I don't want to read all these scriptures, but basically it talks about this story in the first few down to 11 talks about this story in, let me just tell it to you, in Numbers 25. In Numbers 25, it's a story about that God had told them to not intermix. It was really, really important to him that they didn't intermix. And let me read you just the commentary from the Passion Version. I mean, no, uh, it's the voice version. It says, It's difficulty, difficult in our age of diversity intolerance and equality to accept that God prohibited intermarriage between the Israelites and the people of the land and commanded them to eliminate them as they occupied the promised land. He said, this is not a command about ethnicity or purity of race. Okay, that's not what it was about. It's about shared purpose and complete devotion. Now, see, if you do not understand the God of the Old Testament, that it was always about purpose, shared purpose, and complete devotion, you're not going to understand the New Testament at all. You're, in fact, you're not even going to understand why you're here. Wow. And so, this story in Numbers was that a bunch... Now, there was a million people, remember? And he pulled them out of Egypt... He's bringing them over. Remember, it was like a 40-day trip. They turned it into a 40-year trip. They turned it into a 40-year trip because they didn't, as Jeremiah says, they didn't want the yoke around them. They wanted to throw off restraint. They, weren't, they didn't know it. They were slaves, and they came into the open to know God what? So he could speak to their hearts. That's how he made humanity. I wish we could get that. I can't preach on that. But So what happened was, they were hanging out in the wilderness and they decided a bunch of them, like thousands, like 26,000, 24,000, decided they were going to have sex with these other people from Moab, Moabite or Moab somewhere. Who is it? Let me think who it was. Was it the Moabites? I think it was the Moabites. And so they decided they would just do this. But it wasn't enough because, see, the other cultures served their little g gods better wow. than Israel served the big g. Whoa, right. And so just to have satisfaction for a moment, they actually decided to take on the belief system of the Moabite women. Because I propose to you the Moabite women probably wouldn't have sex with them without it. Because they had a standard. This is a crazy story, I'm telling you. But no, not the Israelites. They're like, sure, whatever. And it says that the Moabites invited the Israelites to participate in the Moabite religious rituals and worship of their little G's. It didn't say little G, but it is a little G. And God's people, do you see it? Still calling them God's people, bound themselves to the deity of Baal. Wow. Now, what's interesting about this story, now keep in mind, Paul is referring in Corinthians. Are you with me? Are you following me? Yes. Try to stay with me. I mean, it's a map, okay? It's a map. I'm laying out, okay? We're just going down the map, okay? Come on. All right. So, in Corinthians, he's referring to this as one of Israel's greatest mistakes. And he says, I want you to learn from it. So what happened was that God got mad. It's the Old Testament God, right? Now see, the God of the New Testament still has a standard. Did you remember, did you remember what I just said? Shared purpose, complete devotion. Can I propose to you that we will not fulfill our destiny, side note, without 
complete devotion and finding who has our shared purpose. Do you not realize there's multiple purposes for people to be on earth? Go find your shared purpose people. That way your gift gets trained. That way someone breathes over what's really tiny in you. And so what happened was God began to say, okay, string them up. Basically, that's what it says. String them up. And, and Moses is like, okay, let's grab them. Because it's what God told him. And he says, he, says to the, he says to the judges of Israel, this is what Moses is saying. Okay, look, God told us this. We've got to kill whoever pledged. I mean, we, you know, we've got to eradicate the camp, right? And it says there's a dude. That was like, it said 24,000 people lost their life that day. But there's a dude that just came bringing his woman right through the camp while everybody's dying, right and left. What the world is going on with that? And it said Aaron's son took a spear and stabbed both of them through and killed them. And it said God's anger was satisfied. Why? Why? Because somebody finally upheld the standard on earth. Somebody finally in the camp said, whoa, I get it. I get that it wasn't just about this act of intimacy. I get it now. It was actually about pledging devotion to a God that he just rescued them from. So this again, this is... Back to Corinthians. I'm just laying the foundation. This is Paul. He's trying to tell the story. That's a sad story. He's trying to say, hey, a bunch of people lost their lives there, okay? And he, this is what he says in verse 11. All the tests they endured along the way through the wilderness are a symbolic picture. Now remember, it says that God has the inability to tempt us, right? Right? Because he doesn't tempt people. And do you know what it says in that same scripture? It says, it's our own desires and our motives that pull us into what we're being tempted by. So if God doesn't tempt, what does? I propose to you that Lou has identified places of temptation for you. And if... That's why we're spending so much time on renewing our mind. If my mind's not changed, that I don't need this desire, this temptation, then it pulls me into it. And so that's the premise of what he's saying. That's what happened back with Israel. Their heart, remember, didn't get devoted to God. Remember when they came out, he showed up with the thunder and the lightning. I'm here, I'm doing a big show. They said, oh, oh, you're a scary man. You're a scary God. Moses, you do it. So, Moses, he did it again. They put Moses in the way between them and God. So, Moses had to execute. The ex- he had to perform the execution. Why? Because they couldn't circumcise their own hearts. And so, he says, this is an example that provides us a warning so that we can learn through what they experience. For we live in a time when the purpose of all the ages past is now completing its goal within us. Maybe that gives you a new perspective. So beware if you think it couldn't happen to you lest your pride becomes your downfall. So he's just saying, okay, listen, that happened because of temptation And then temptation led to serving a brand new God, pledging complete loyalty to a brand new... That's just a warning. But then, the next scripture, which we all know this next one. We just forgot that first part. Now, I'm going to read it to you in a minute. But recently, I went to one of those escape rooms. Have you ever been to one of those? I want to go again. It's like a puzzle in a box, is what it is. And we weren't any good at it, so... The cool part is that there's a guy watching you. And he's got a little screen up there. And when you're over there running around like a, 
chicken with its head cut off, and I've seen that, and it's just like this. But that, and you can't find your way out, he'll send you a little clue up there. And you'll go, oh, yeah, we're not even doing anything right right here because he's watching you. Now, see, God's kind of that way. You're in a great big escape room. And there's things in this room for you to learn. Now, what the guy said at the escape room is, if you get on a lockdown, just ring the bell and I'll open the door. Because I'm sure he didn't want anybody to feel claustrophobic. See, I, I propose to you, that's what happens in the training process with God. So let's read the scripture with that in mind. We all experience times of, this word here is temptation. This word here says testing. Testing and temptation here is the same word. It's the same word over there where I was mentioning that it said God's, God does not tempt anyone. This is the same word, okay? Which is normal for every human being. Don't you love that? It's normal for you to be tempted. It has nothing to do with whether you're saved. You really need to repeat that stuff to your I mean to yourself. You need to say, or oh, it has nothing to be it has nothing to do with it. It has to do with you. You have an enemy. God's not using that particular kind. That's so good. The reason it exists in our life is because of our own desires. So that doesn't that make us want to change our desires? I bet if we change our desires, our level of temptation changes. Now we may not all be in here being tempted by a bunch of sexual things, but we're tempted to do things without him. Yes. We're tempted. You know, one of the things that I've discovered in flowing with the Holy Spirit and doing things the Holy Spirit's way, like I preached on last week, the impulse of the Holy Spirit is I don't know what's going on. I don't know how it's going to work out. I'm a systematic girl. I make lists. I like charts. I like to put things in groups. I have probably 400 lists on my phone currently. I love to make lists. I love to have a team meeting every day. I don't get to, but that would be my desire because I want us to be organized. I want us to be well-informed. I want communication going on. I want to know what's happening. I want to help us move forward. But with the Holy Spirit, He knows all of that. I don't get to know all that. So my choice is, am I going to do what's comfortable for Teresa? And I, am I going to get it all my, what I call, ducks in a row, back to the lake? So I'm watching the mother duck, and when the bully duck comes along, she begins to speak to the little baby ducks. These are, I'm talking less than two-week-old two ducks, but they already know the voice of the mother. And when the mother says, <laughs> that's what it sounds like to me. I'm sure it's saying, get to the side. That's what it's really saying. <laughs> Big dog cometh. That's what she's saying. <laughs> they immediately turn and, and go right toward her. Wow. Immediately. When the big dog, the big um, Rottweiler is coming down the way and the guy's laughing. <laughs> and I heard mama, what? I mean, those little baby ducks, probably three days old, they were in the water in seconds. Wow. Wow. Why? Because they learn to yield to the voice of the one that knows. They don't even think they know. So it's normal for us to be tempted. But here's the period at the end of that statement. And guess what the next word is? But God. But God will be faithful to you. And he will screen and filter the severity of nature and timing of every trial you face see i look at it like there's a big dam that could just tsunami you <laughs> and his tiny little pinky is just holding back just let little low water in right he's not gonna let the enemy destroy you but listen to this so that you can bear it. But listen. And each test is an opportunity to trust him more. I love how Graham Cook says. If you don't get this scripture for your life. Listen to Graham. 
He'll blow your mind in this area. He's basically saying, even if it's something that the enemy does, God uses everything for you to win. Not just barely bear it. But listen, each test is an opportunity to trust him more. For along with every trial, that's a different word than the temptation, God has provided for you a way of escape that will bring you out victoriously. This is the picture I saw. We're in this escape room, right? Well, how do we get here? Could be different reasons. Could have had a, a sickness. You know, I was trying to explain to Christy the other day the scripture that I read last week. Do you remember it was in Romans 8? Let me just read it to you just to refresh our memory. <laughs> it was that we are his true heir and we qualify to share all of his treasures because we are indeed heirs of God himself. So since we're joined with Christ, this is Romans 8, 17, we also inherit, inherit all that's his and all that he has. That's a lot of stuff. Yes. We will experience being co-glorified, however. So it's kind of a different thing, right? Mm -hmm. So we're heirs and we're getting it all. Yeah. But there's a co-laboring process he's inviting us to now. This is how I see it. I experience this. That's why I see it this way. There's a co-laboring process right now. What co-labor mean? That somebody has a way to see something and a way to perform something in the way they see it. And I come alongside and I get to not only participate in doing it, but then when somebody said, who did that? God say, we did it. Yes. Co-glory. So, if he says, okay, I need you to stream something out to the worldwide, and I need you to do some prophetic singing, he's got the words, but I'm going to play, and I'm going to play, and I'm going to sing, and I get to co with him. So then when somebody says, who is that singing that? God says, it's us. We're singing it. We're co. And it says... We experience being co-glorified with him, provided that we accept his sufferings. Now, see, I grew up acting, people acted like we were going to have to be actually crucified on the cross or something. I'm pretty sure that's what they were trying to tell us, that there is going to be suffering, people. And I got to thinking the other day, why would anyone come to know Jesus just to know that we're going to suffer? If he satisfied sin... And he satisfied disease and sickness and grief and guilt. And every single thing is satisfied on the cross. Why then now do I say, that's not even what that word means. It means understand how he feels. Let's go about the globe. So I was explaining this to Mendel. When I had the monster mass, I had, I had lots of people that gave me lots of responses. I literally had a lady say to me, I'm not going to come to your church anymore because I'm afraid you're going to die. I know, it's shocking, but it's true. And she went on to be the greatest critic of my ministry that I've ever had, still in existence today, still criticizing me, still going on the World Wide Web, still because she was afraid I was going to die. But then I had Christy, who's home, interceding, crying out, just waiting for the phone call to see if it's cancer or not. And I was telling her, see, you co-labored, and a lot of other people did too, but I'm just using this as an example. She co-labored and experienced and felt my suffering. She became acquainted with how I felt. The other person said, well, I'm only going to come if there's parties. I'm not going to, I don't want to become acquainted with you and your suffering. See, that's, if you begin to understand the heart of God can be performed in the earth through mothers and fathers and children when someone understands how God feels about the earth. Yeah. If you just think, well, you just killed 24,000 people in the Old Testament, you don't understand. No, it was about devotion. It was about that he actually said something and someone actually went against what he said. Then you understand somebody needs to stand up to the bullies of this world and say, I will not. You will not. 
not in my presence. So I holler across the girl who's got the big stick, throwing it at the, la- at, at the little babies, and I say, stop throwing the sticks. Who are you going to tell? Stop throwing the sticks. Who are you watching and seeing and turning away and acting like you don't see? See, God is saying that I want you to co with me because I want you to experience my glory. In Jeremiah 2, it's an interesting scripture that Chrissy found yesterday. It kind of blew my mind. I think I have it here. Yes, Jeremiah 2, 11, it says, My people have traded my glory for empty God dreams and silly God schemes. It says in the voice, it says, But my beloved people, that's what God is still talking. It's the same verse. My beloved people have done just that. They have exchanged the glory, their glory, to pursue worthless idols in their vain attempt for greater prosperity. How many times are we exchanging the co-glorifiedness of God for our own glory? How many times are we looking away and seeing people doing that and we don't say anything? So so, So back to 1 Corinthians 10, he's saying, I'll make a way, I'll provide a doorway of escape to bring you out victoriously. So let's think about it. We're in the escape room. Here's the way I look at it. Sometimes I find myself in there because I'm stupid. You know what I'm saying? I had a stupid thought. You know what I mean? And I'm all in turmoil. I'm trying to do the buttons and turn the knobs. And up on the screen is a sign that says, that ain't it. Look at your punch in the wrong color. Now, if I look at the screen, then I can perform... Whatever that next, to what get the next clue? This is such a good analogy for <laughs> Christendom. But if I ever get in a panic, I just have to punch the button. The doorway of escape is always there. But do I want to learn in the room what I need to learn, or do I just want to go to another room? Because, see, in that room, if I look at it like, This is too much pain. This is too hard. Just push the button. The way of escape. He wants you to be victorious. He doesn't want, he's not wanting you to be in there in all misery and pain. He's wanting you to get the idea of why the room's been set up. It's been set up for your entertainment. For you to figure out how great you are. See, I do this with people a lot. We recently got a new soundboard. And I told people, we're going to be using this soundboard. But nothing happened. And so I just said one day, today's the day. Guess what? Everybody gets right on learning that soundboard that day. Because guess what? We removed the old soundboard. This is our only option, and it's on you. Point to her. And it's on you. (laughs) Now, see, she can either accept that escape room challenge. Vinton purchased... A whole class with his own money for them to get to watch. They can either watch the class or they can say, Oh, this is just too hard for me. I don't really feel like I can. I don't feel like I'm good at it. And they could push the button. They could text Tisa and say, I'm not doing it. And Tisa would open the door. There's a way of escape. But the room is not what you think. The room is for your entertainment to see how good you are. Calandra yeah. didn't know how awesome she is yes. at sound engineering. Seriously. She didn't know she could take some criticism and critique and live. <laughs> that it would not kill her or destroy her. She would get out of bed the next day. <laughs> you see... The way of escape is to bring, just think how you feel. When we were in the escape room, we figured it out. We opened the door. All six of us got a shirt. Why? Because we came to the escape room. We stayed. We didn't give up. We kept pushing the buttons and turning the knobs and finding out the colors and doing the puzzles. And eventually, we opened the door. 
Papa's such a good papa, though. Yeah. If you need to push the button that day, it's okay. It's okay. He's such a good father. What he wants you to do is he wants you to discover how good he is. Yeah. He's not trying to slaughter people. But he requires complete devotion. And wouldn't you? And wouldn't you? You know, if you get married, don't you have the anticipation that your husband or wife is not going to be out sleeping with other people every night? Don't, isn't that just part of the commitment? Don't you have just this thing where you're hoping that you're, you're getting married and you're thinking, he's never going to hit me. He's never going to cuss me out. He's never going to beat me up. We just have an, an anticipation of what marriage is. Did you know God has that same anticipation with His Son? He gave a son as a groom. He has an anticipation that His bride is going to be loving and kind. And His bride is going to be giving. And his bride is going to want to work on her imperfections. She's going to do the Esther process and she's going to purify, not because she was so gross and ugly, but because I only want to do the best for this king. Yeah. Yeah. I love this last two scriptures for us. James 1. It says, in simple humility, James 1.21, this is in the message, I think, James 1.21, in simple humility, let our gardener God landscape you with the word, <laughs> making a salvation garden of your life. You know, I love flowers. I hate to water. I want someone to come and make beautiful baskets of flowers at my house, and then I want them to come over and water them every day, and that doesn't exist. <laughs> so I vicariously look at other people's flowers and envision them in places around my house. And Why is it that God made flowers? We don't eat them. I mean, some people do. I think some of them. There's some edible ones, you know what I'm saying. But they're not a food source. What things in life does God make that looks insignificant to us, but display His beauty? I propose to you that the attributes such as your patience and your goodness and your kindness and your meekness and your self-control... Those are beautiful flowers. Can you make it through life without them? You probably can. Do they enhance the beauty? Do they need watering? Do they need weeding? Yeah. They need a little work. But guess what? When people come to your house, they're going to say, Wow, you've been with the Holy Spirit, I can tell. That beautiful orchid you have is peace. And I need some... And you say, I've got extra clip. Let me give you a bouquet of what I've been working on. First Corinthians 3 says, for we're co-workers with God. You're God's cultivated garden. The house he's building. And God has given trainers, this was Paul speaking, unique gifts as a skilled master builder who lays a good foundation. Afterwards, another craftsman comes along and builds on it. So builders beware. Let every builder do his work carefully according to God's standard. He's speaking to leaders here. He's saying, this probably isn't the house you found salvation in. I don't know if this is the house you're going to live your whole life in or not. I'm going to treat everyone here and always have like they'll be here forever. And I'll bless them when they leave, even if they don't tell me they're leaving. Because this, the doors open both ways. Yeah. The entrance door is wide open. The exit door is wide open. Yeah. 
But see, beware. Because a leader, a builder, needs to make sure what he says right here, you're doing it to God's standards. Don't build something for God that's not God's standard. You know, I try to teach this principle in our business. Don't come and work for me if you're not going to look like me. You know, that's how we should operate in our businesses, in our employment. Think about who started the company. Think about what their original design for the company is and go a little higher. Don't just try to skirt in under the lowest watered down version of it that there is to exist now. Remember, God's standard comes with the ability to complete it. It says, for no one is empowered. This is 1 Corinthians 3, 10, 11. For no one is empowered to lay an alternative foundation other than the good foundation that already exists, which is Jesus. That's how you know. Are you, were you trained and are you training Jesus' standards? That's it. That's all, that's the only thing that grows in this garden, y'all. I mean, you can plant a garden of a bunch of other uh, hideous things. Woo! <laughs> And it'll grow into a weed. You know, it's interesting about weeds. You know, whenever you have a neighbor that has a weed-filled uh, yard, not even your yard, the weeds blow over to your yard. That's why, think about it, if everybody in the neighborhood did something to de-weed their yard, all of the yards would look pretty. It's because Joe Blow down here doesn't care. He doesn't mow, he doesn't weed, blows over here, and I'm spending money every quarter to get rid of my weeds, you see? That's what happens in life. You run into people, they haven't been weeding nothing. They're overgrown. Their soul is Java the Hut. They are big. They're doing anything they want. And you try to bring up your standard to them, they haven't, they don't even know what you're talking about. I think I'm done. Let me pray over us before Cheryl comes. Papa, I just thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you for your word. I thank you that you didn't create temptation, that actually our own desires for our own way or for a false way or for an, even an old way we've known before actually are, are the mo, is the motivation. But you made a way for us to escape the hardness if it's too much. You made a road out. Because yeah. you're just trying to train us. And so today we, today we just speak to our desires and we just tell them, won't you tell your desires to change? Yeah. Just say, I tell my desires all the same. Time change to be God's desires. You have power to speak and tell yourself what to do. So begin to tell yourself what to do. And so, Papa, I just thank you today of what you're doing in our hearts and lives. I thank you so much for this day. Again, I just bless and honor the mothers today. I bless what you're doing in their lives. And I just pray that they would be the ones that would love beyond their borders. Yeah. I just ask that you would teach them to love beyond their borders, that you place within them a mothering heart to love beyond their own children, their own borders. In yeah. Jesus' name, amen. Come on, Cheryl. Yeah. That's an amazing word. Um, as we move into offering today, he was talking to me about breaking and what breaking does. And I feel like a lot of times we hear the word breaking and we view it in this negative way, but it's actually the opposite in the kingdom. And so I was looking through the Bible of all these different um, ways that Papa breaks. Um, and some of them include breaking down, breaking free, breaking in, breaking out, releasing breakthrough. Um, and so I found all these different examples 
Um, one when uh, when they needed to feed those thousands of people, it was through broken loaves um, that produced a miracle to feed thousands of people. And then, like we were talking about in communion today, it was the breaking of bread. He prescribed that breaking of bread that gave access to intimacy and relationship. Um, and then, of course, with Jesus, you know, Jesus allowed himself to be broken because he knew it would give access to freedom and access to Papa. So, you know, and even um, from the message a couple weeks ago about breaking jars, what those two women breaking their jars released over Jesus. Um, so just all these examples. And even when uh, Mama T was just talking about our garden, you know, um, gardens require this breaking process. Um, and I'm super obsessed with plants right now. And so I do a lot of research and part of the pruning process actually looks like cutting off really, really good branches. And the plant actually thinks that it's dying. Um, but that place where there's that one stem, there becomes two. And so I just feel like, um, I feel like he just wants to connect that with offering these places that we um, <laughs> try to keep together and are really, really tight on. He actually wants us to break open and break out. And it may feel stretching and it may feel like we're dying, if we're being honest. But um, he, wants to, he wants to increase us in that area. And so... Um, I just invite you today to ask him where are those places that he actually wants um, to break you out of an old way um, in giving. And so with that, we're going to do our offering decree. And so I'll read a line, and then you guys can repeat back. And don't forget, we've upped up the ante in, in the last um, line. So... I bring my offering to you today. I bring my offering to you today. And I declare your word over my seed. And I declare your word over my seed. Give generously. Give generously. And generous gifts, and generous gifts will be given back to me. Will be given back to me. Shaken down. Shaken down. To make room for more. To make room for more. Abundant gifts will pour out upon me. Abundant gifts will pour out upon me. With such an overflowing measure. That it, will run over the top. that it will run over the top. My measurement of generosity, my measurement of generosity becomes, my measurement of your return. becomes my measurement of your return. So I freely give from all that you supply. I declare with my giving, I with my giving all, is in your care. all is in your care. Let generosity, Let generosity arise within my heart within my tribe, within my, tribe. Within, my city, within my city, within my state, within my, state. Within my, nation, within my nation, and all the nations of the world. And all the nations of the world. Yeah. And so if you want to break free today, if you want to practically learn how to break open his goodness, we've got a couple ways that you can give through our website at onelifeok.com and with our cash app, and the handle is dollar sign one life okay. And so I just bless this offering today, and let's welcome Mama Sarah as she closes us up. Thank you for joining today, and just want to bless you, and I bless all the mamas. Thank you for all of your sacrifice. Thank you for all of your laying down your own lives and everything else for your kids. And so I just want to bless the mamas today. And I just want to thank you. Thank you for tuning in. And I just pray over your heart that this seed is just received really well. And Daddy, I just thank you for what you're doing in our life. I thank you that you are taking us from glory to glory. You are truly taking us higher and higher and higher. We want to look like your son. That's the goal. We want to look like your son. So, Daddy, may we be just a people chasing after the image of looking like your son. So we love you, we love you, and we thank you for what you've done today. And I bless all your people. Don't forget to tune in on Wednesday at 630. Love you all. Bye.